Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. This is Asif Qureshi and you are watching Dr. Asif Lectures. In this video, we will be discussing about how to systematically approach blood report tests which are related to blood glucose levels. These include fasting blood sugar, random blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C levels as well as the oral glucose tolerance test. Now, before we move on to these individual parameters, it is important to understand some general rules. See guys, all of you belong to medical profession and there will be days when you will be holding the laboratory reports in your hand and you will be uh, expected to interpret the values and the data in the reports. So therefore, this course is very important for you to master the laboratory interpretation and do the laboratory interpretation like a boss, as I always say. Now, in order to master the laboratory interpretation, there are some general rules. For example, you must understand that whatever laboratory test you are reading, what are the indications for the test? In which conditions should a doctor yourself prescribe this test? So what are the disease clinical condition where that particular test is needed? So that is number one thing. You must understand the indications for writing that particular test, okay? The second thing you need to understand, is there any preparation associated with that particular test. For example, when we say fasting blood sugar, your fasting blood glucose, how long a patient must be fasting, for how long the patient must not be eating anything. So what is the protocol? What is the preparation? What is the preparation time for a particular test? So you must understand what are the indications for a test. You must understand what are any preparations associated with the particular test and only after you understand these two things, you should be able to interpret the laboratory values. See, when you have the report in your hand, there are some values there and there are normal reference ranges. Anybody, even a layman can have the report and can say, okay, this value is not in the reference range. So this is an abnormal value. But what next? You as a medical professional, you should be able to interpret those values beyond their normal appearances, okay? So in order to do that, in order to master this, you should be knowing what are the indications, why was this patient prescribed this particular test, what are the preparations, and then you jump on to interpreting the value. So today in this lecture, we will discuss all of them one by one, and I will try to make it very systematic for you so that whenever you have a laboratory report in your hand, you should follow these steps, okay? And remember this point, that is very important. All laboratory reports are snapshots. Now guys, what does that mean? See, this is very important concept. If somebody has a sodium level of, for example, 140, that may look normal on that particular report. But you need to understand what was the sodium level yesterday? What was the sodium level day before yesterday? Because largely uh, these reports you'll be very much concerned about in the hospital setting for the inpatients who are admitted, okay? So it is important to understand what is the progression of that particular laboratory value. Because if the patient had 160 sodium two days ago, and now this is 140, so the trend is downward. But if the patient has laboratory sodium value uh, today is 140, but after two days, it goes to 180. So this normal value, which is looking normal today, is moving upward. So my point is, and which you should also understand very clearly, that all laboratory reports are snapshots. They're telling you the values on the time and date of sample taken. But as a good doctor, you should always understand what were the values beforehand if they are available. If not, what are the values in the prospective manner in future, what will be the value? So all these sort of information are important. Remember these general rules, okay? Since today we are talking about a glucose test, I'll be talking about indications associated with uh, fasting blood sugar, random blood sugar, and let's move on to the next slide. Indications. So when do you do, when a doctor prescribes uh, fasting blood sugar, random blood sugar, HbA1c level, and OGTT, okay? Let's crack them one by one. Fasting blood sugar. If there are any symptoms of diabetes, for example, the doctor will prescribe. Or if there are any symptoms of hypoglycemia, say for example, in, in, in your clinical setting, there is a patient who comes in and suddenly collapses. 
If a patient suddenly collapses, you should check glucose levels because hypoglycemia is associated with uh, such episodes. So whenever there are any symptoms of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, doctor should prescribe this, okay? But now uh, the guidelines have changed. Now the guidelines for sugar testing is this. Whenever you insert a needle in the vein for anything, any other test, say for example, your doctor prescribes you urea creatinine electrolytes or LFTs. So obviously somebody will take blood sample. So whenever there is a needle inside, check the sugar levels as well. This is now recommended because diabetes is getting common day by day. So it's advisable. You should not wait for the symptoms actually. Whenever you have a blood test, any sort of blood test, get your sugar checked, okay? Now for HbA1c, uh, again, if there are symptoms, HbA1c can be used as a diagnostic tool for diabetes mellitus, okay? Uh, but more importantly, you should also remember that hemoglobin A1c levels are usually prescribed for monitoring the long-term responses, uh, long-term compliance of the patient, long-term glucose condition of the patient, because if you remember, HbA1c is basically, and this is in one of my metabolism lectures and this video you should always watch so that you understand what do we actually mean by hemoglobin A1c, okay? It's the aldehyde group interacting with the amino group, okay, of the hemoglobin molecule. So uh, HbA1c basically long-term compliance of treatment. If the patient is not taking treatment properly of diabetes, then the glucose levels will be high and HbA1c level will be high. They will not come back, okay? If the HbA1c levels are coming back, that's a good sign that the constant long-term chronic control of glucose is very good, okay? And OGTT is something that we order when we find somebody having impaired fasting glucose. Now, this term, park in your head, I will tell you what do we mean by impaired fasting glucose. So, this slide basically summarizes what are the indications for writing each one of these tests, okay? I hope this is clear. Now, let us talk about what are the preparations required for fasting blood sugar, random blood sugar, hemoglobin A1c, okay? When we talk about fasting blood sugar, you tell your patient that, hey, you have to get your fasting blood sugar checked. Patient will ask you, what time in the morning should I go? For how long should I fast? Can I drink water? Can I take my... Panadol if, if there is headache. So here are some guidelines for you, okay? So the best time for checking fasting blood sugar is to take the sample at between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. That's the best suitable time. Research shows that. And it's usually advisable to fast from the midnight, from 12 in the night before. You don't eat anything in the morning at 8 a.m. You go for your blood collection, okay? You can have water occasionally if you need. It's advisable to avoid any medications if possible, okay? If there is some emergency, you can take medicines, but usually it's advisable to avoid the medications. For random blood sugar and HbA1c, not much, can be checked anytime during the day, okay? Now, I said for RBS, for random blood sugar and HbA1c, although they can be performed anytime during the day, but there are some important points to remember for HbA1c. You should not rely on HbA1c levels or they are not very sensitive and specific if these conditions are there with the patient. If the patient has any hemoglobinopathy, hemolytic anemia, or if the age of the patient is, is, is in the child age group, or if the person is suffering from HIV or chronic kidney disease, or if the patient is taking steroids, all these conditions are summarized under the heading of disturbed cellular turnover. If the patient has hemoglobinopathies, the 120 day time life cycle of red blood cells will be disturbed, okay? And so will be with the case of hemolytic anemia and all these other cases listed here. Therefore, if any one of this is present in the patient, HbA1c level is not the laboratory test to rely upon, okay? That's an important thing to remember. Now, what are the preparations for oral glucose tolerance test? Oral glucose tolerance test it's advisable to have three days unrestricted. So you remove any restrictions on carbohydrate activity and carbohydrate intake, eight to 14 hours 
Fasting is advisable, no medication if possible on the test day. And what happens on the test day? You go in the laboratory or the hospital, what they do is they dissolve 75 grams of glucose in 250 ml of water and they give this juice to you and you drink the juice in five minutes, no more than five minutes, okay? And then your blood sample is collected at zero. Zero means before drinking the glucose solution, okay? So that's the fasting value because you have been fasting since uh, 8 to 14 hours and now before drinking glucose your blood sample is taken so this is the zero time value or the fasting glucose and then you check it after two hours sometimes people also check it after 30 minutes and one hour but most of the hospitals the guidelines are that after two hours at 120 minutes you check the glucose levels again so at zero minutes and at two hours okay and uh, some people also advise urine test along with the blood test. But anyways, that's not a routine. So in summary, what is OGTT? Fasting. Go in the morning to the laboratory or the hospital. Drink the solution. Before drinking the solution, they take your blood. After two hours of drinking the solution, they take your blood and check the blood glucose levels. Okay. So that is all about the indications why these tests are prescribed and the preparations associated with these tests. Okay. Now. Let's talk about interpretation. Now, since you know what are the indications and what are the preparations, now you have the laboratory report in your hand. And now you want to interpret. And for the interpretation, these are always, always, always the rules of thumb you must follow. Okay? So first of all, check the patient's identity. You don't want to treat a patient on based on somebody else's report. That's not advisable. Okay? So you always, 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 first of all, check the identity if it's the same patient. And then you understand the units. So for example, for glucose measurement, there are different units in different laboratories in different countries. So you should know if there are different units existing. If there are different units of a particular analyte, you should know all of them, okay? And what are the important terms? What is hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia? You should know these terminologies before you can interpret a report and then you interpret the values. Guys, this is very important. Usually, many of the doctors, what they do is they hang on the report, oh, this is the value and this means this is not normal. No, no, no. You should know the indication. Why was this patient prescribed this test? You should know what were the preparations and were the preparations followed. Did the patient really fast from the midnight? Did the patient really come in the morning at the right time for the phlebotomy? So you should know this. And only after that you have the report in your hand and there also you first check the identity, understand the units, under, understand the appropriate terms and now is the time for analyzing the real values. Let us now talk about each component of interpretation. I told you, you first have to check patient's identity. Now, these are the things you should do for patient identity check. CNIC is the best thing. Many reports do write CNIC value. You ask the patient for the CNIC, match it. If it's matching, it's the right patient. Name alone is not authentic because similar names can happen. John, Tom, Dick, Harry, all these things. Um, Mushtaq, Muhammad Yusuf, these are all very common names, okay? So don't rely on the names only. And usually two forms of identity. So you check the NIC number and you check the name and that's for sure the same patient. Always do this practice, okay? Now understand the units. Whatever the units are used for that particular analyte, you should be knowing those units, okay? For example, uh, uh, units for glucose, in British system, it is millimoles per liter, but in American system, it's milligram per deciliter, so you should know the difference. Uh, it's not a good idea to have in your head the values of millimoles per liter, and then in the report, the values are milligrams per deciliter, and you are interpreting it all wrong, okay? You don't want to do that. So let's understand what, what does that mean. Uh, if you have to convert by any chance millimoles per liter into milligrams per deciliter, it's a simple calculation. You simply multiply the millimole value by 18, okay? And the product gives you the value in milligram per deciliter. So that's a simple calculation. For example, if the report says seven millimoles per liter, you multiply this by 18 and the answer is 126. And this seven millimole per liter is actually equal to 126 milligrams per DL, okay? So that's a simple calculation. Always know your units. 
for glucose, this is important. Similarly, if you talk about HbA1c levels, HbA1c level usually in the British system, and we also follow this, millimoles per mole is the unit for HbA1c. But also in American and so many other systems, also in our system, many laboratories report HbA1c levels as percentage, okay? So here I have given a small comparison table. The values of HbA1c in percentages and their conversion in millimoles per mole. And that's pretty simple. You see, from in, in, the, in the table column left, where the percentages are mentioned, you start reading from down to up. The values in percentages are 5%, 6%, 7%, 8%, 9%, and 10%. So it's in the increasing order, okay? And now you see the table in the millimoles per mole is actually starting from three. And again, it's an increasing order, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if you can remember this, the lowest value of hemoglobin A1C in percentage in your head as five, and then go upward, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and in, in millimoles per mole, you start with three, four, five, six, seven, it's easy for you to do the conversion. You don't need a calculator, you don't need uh, to go on Google or any up-to-date uh, website to get the, get the real results. You can actually convert it in your head, okay, like this. So five percent of HbA1c is actually equal to 31. So next to three, you write one, and then next to four, you write two, three, four, five, six, okay? So it's all in the increasing order upwards. So you can figure your head around that 5% is actually equal to 31%. But it's a little trick. Start from percentages five, six, seven, eight. It start from millimole per mole, three, four, five, six, and then next to three, one, two, three, four, go upward, okay? Uh, whatever, if you want to memorize this, you can memorize this. I remember it this way, and you can also check always online. But the important point is that always remember that the report is telling you the value of HbA1c either in percentage or in millimoles per mole, okay? And you have to interpret accordingly. Now, the third point in interpretation was understanding the terminologies. You should know what is a fasting blood sugar, okay? Fasting blood sugar is FBS, which is um, the blood glucose levels of a patient in fasting state, okay? You should know this, right? Then random blood sugar, you should know what is it. OGTT is oral glucose tolerance. And also the terminologies associated with the test. For example, normal glycemic. A person having normal blood glucose levels, hyperglycemic is high glucose levels, hypoglycemic is low glucose level. You should also know what is impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. Hang on with me and I will tell you in a minute what do these last terminologies mean, okay? Now, once you have checked the patient's identity, you know the indications, you know what are the preparations, and then you are sure with the identity of the patient and you have done all the preliminary checks. Now the values are in front of you. Now let us talk about the values. A normal person is somebody who has a fasting blood sugar equal or less than six millimoles per liter. If you want to convert it into milligrams per deciliter, I told you, multiply this by 18, okay? Uh, so fasting blood sugar equal or less than six millimoles per liter is a normal person, okay? Similarly, if a person has HbA1c levels of 41 millimole per mole, the person is um, a normal glycemic person. It's a normal person, okay? Now, when are the values dangerous? So when we talk about diabetes, these are the dangerous values, guys. Is If the fasting blood sugar is equal or more than seven millimoles per liter, that is a person who is in the diabetic range. Or if the random blood sugar is equal or more than 11.1, that's the person who is in the diabetic range. HbA1c more than 48 millimole per mole is the person in the diabetic range. So you know the normal ranges, now you know the panic ranges, diabetic ranges, okay? But also remember this, if there are symptoms of diabetes present, that any one of these readings on any one occasion is the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. But if there are no symptoms, the patient is symptomatically absolutely normal, then these tests should be repeated at least once to confirm the diagnosis, okay? So here I write, if there are symptoms, one readout is enough, but if there are no symptoms, at least two readings, because it may be that the patient is saying to you that I was fasting, but in the middle of the night, he had a sugar cane juice. And in the morning, the glucose values were very, very high. So you want to repeat this one more time, telling the patient that you have to be making sure that you fast for eight to 14 hours, okay? So if there are no symptoms, you do it two times. If there are symptoms, one reading is enough, okay? So that's the normal range, 
That's the diabetic range. What's in the middle? In the middle is the pre-diabetes. There is the person who is in this range. He is prone. He or she is prone to get diabetes if not taken care of. Okay. So that is called the pre-diabetic range. And what is the pre-diabetic range? The fasting blood sugar of 6.1 to 6.9 and hemoglobin of 42 to 47. Now, if you check a patient and the blood glucose levels are falling in the pre-diabetic range, this is what we call impaired fasting glucose. If the fasting glucose is in the pre-diabetic range, this is impaired fasting glucose. So if somebody asks you, what is impaired fasting glucose? Impaired fasting glucose is not a diabetic patient. He or she is a patient who has the fasting blood sugar levels in the pre-diabetic range. That person is prone to getting diabetes, but at the moment, impaired fasting glucose, okay? Now for this person, what you do is OGTT to confirm what is the situation of, you know, um, pancreatic insulin handling of glucose. So if somebody is found in this range, so this is pretty simple guys. If somebody is normal, good news. If somebody is diabetic, start the treatment. If somebody is in the pre-diabetic stage, which means the impaired fasting glucose, you do OGTT. And that is the interpretation of the values for sugars, okay? Now, what is impaired glucose tolerance? Now, if somebody, I told you, if somebody is found in the impaired fasting glucose range, you do the OGTT. And if doing the OGTT, I told you, what is OGTT? You fast for the night, go in the morning to the hospital or the laboratory, they take your blood before drinking the juice and then you drink the juice and at two hours they take your blood again. And if fasting sugar will be this, this is why this patient is advised OGTT. So the fasting sugar of this patient will be in the pre-diabetic range. Now when you do OGTT and the two hour value is this, 7.8 to 11.1 millimole, ah, that, that, is, that is called impaired glucose tolerance which means when you challenge the patient with glucose load, the patient cannot handle it, okay? So these are the, it's yet not diabetes, it's yet not diabetes because the definition of diabetes was this, definition of diabetes was this, more than 11.1, okay? More than 11.1, but here the values are between 7.8 and 11.1, so this patient can develop diabetes anytime because the glucose tolerance is impaired. So there's a difference between impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. Impaired fasting glucose is the fasting glucose levels in the pre-diabetic range, 6.1 to 6.9. But after the OGTT, at two hours, if these are the values, this is impaired glucose tolerance, okay? So now you know what is the normal range, you know what is the diabetic range, you know what is pre-diabetes, you know what is impaired fasting glucose, and you know what is impaired glucose tolerance. So this is all about interpreting glucose related laboratory values. If you want to know more about glucose metabolism, I have given a link of my previous video in the description so you can watch that video so that you understand how is glucose handled in your body. Um, I will back to you very soon with another video on another lab report. Thank you very much.